Okay, hi everybody, I'm Patrick Butler. I'm the former religion editor for the Tyler Morning Telegraph in Tyler, Texas. I just wrapped up seven years being a section editor for the 10th largest newspaper in Texas. And um, I'm here to help orient people to some journalism practices that I picked up while I was uh, working with an, this Associated Press newspaper. So I wanna talk today about journalism and a little bit about what journalism is and it isn't. So the thing about journalism is, what is a good story? That's what we all want to do. We want to get a good story. So in your mind, you may think about, well, what is a good story and what is not? Well, for a journalist, a day-to-day -day workaholic journalist, a good story is a story that people read. If they read it, it was good. If they didn't read it, it was bad. <laughs> it didn't matter how much time and effort you put into it. Um, it didn't matter what erudite words you used or how clever you thought you were. If they didn't read it, it wasn't a good story. If they read a five-inch brief and got some information out of it and it changed them or it helped orient them, that was a good story. So we have to learn what uh, good is. And as Duke Ellington once said about music, learn it all, learn everything you can about what everyone else has done, then forget it. Okay. So for those of you, I was a print journalist. I worked in television news as well, but I, my last seven years, actually 10 years, I spent in print journalism. And I can tell you there's a difference between the written word uh, and the, the visual word, but still the stories need to be written. They need to be conceived and they need to be thought out. So one of the things I'd like to do right away is ask you to think, what is, um, well, let's put it this way. What is a religion story? What is a religion story versus a news story? Um, and what I'd like to suggest to you is that there's no difference. It's just a story. A story is a story is a story. And uh, the reporter goes on the scene, and what a journalist does is that they observe what is happening. They're observers, not participants. There's a big difference. An observer goes on to the scene and says, what's happening here? They write down the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and then they report on it. Now, if someone says something about God or faith or the universe, that's part of the story because they said it. So we don't serve as editors where we say, well, I'm not going to say that in my story because it's prohibited. A good journalist will say this is part of the story. So what we want to do is get away from the sacred and secular split. There's this thought uh, that's popular that there are some subjects that are taboo in journalism. We don't talk about certain things. Well, that's changing. And you can think just in the last 10 years, some of the things that you read in the newspaper you would never would have read um, 10 years ago. Stories about incest, stories about sex clubs, uh, gay marriage, can you imagine 20 years ago? Stories about gay marriage in this country, it just wouldn't, um, in this 2011 right now, 20 years ago it would have been sort of unthinkable. And now it's very common. And one of the things that has happened is that stories on faith and God and perceptions of the purpose of life have come to the forefront. USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, um, and a lot of local newspapers are talking about people's perception of their purpose of life. And that can fit into a reporter's story. Okay, so I told you earlier that um, as a believer, I'm one of the most hidden gospel people <laughs> you'd ever want to meet as a writer. But that said, I want to, um, I long to impart a spiritual gift to you at a, at a perception. And this is the perception. Interviewing, uh, my goal is to make you a different type of journalist. The biggest affirmation I ever got as a journalist was the constant comment that the people had never been asked the questions that I asked, that it was refreshing to them, and they enjoyed the interview. And some prominent people who said this to me were uh, Golf champion Bernard Langer, author Philip Yancey, Ruth Bell Graham, daughter of Billy Graham, uh, football great Earl Campbell, Toby Mack of DC Talk, and syndicated columnist Cal Thomas all told me after I interviewed them that they'd never been asked these questions before. How's that? You know, that kind of <laughs> that kind of made my day. Now I wasn't a great journalist for a great uh, newspaper. I was a great journalist for a small newspaper. Um, I wasn't with the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, but wherever you are, and for people who are watching in video, don't think that you'll never meet a famous person, because you will at some point. 
You may meet the president of the country that you're living in. Uh, you may meet heads of state. Uh, you may meet prominent sportsmen. Um, they need us as much as we need them. So if they, when they find out you're a writer or a documentarian or some kind of, of uh, a pub public relations person, not public relations as in PR, but uh, presenting them to the public, they will pay attention to you. So don't think that you won't run into these people. So the trick is to ask them good questions. And that's what I want to focus on uh, right now, how to ask different questions. Okay, the elements of a good story, now you've heard are the who, what, when, why, where, and how. Okay, that's what we're told as journalists, that we need to, to get those things. But those are not, um, those are the things you need to validate the story to give it credibility. We talked about that earlier today that the credibility is very important. It to prove to the public you're not making the stuff up, that these are real people in a real place that you're talking to. And it's actually a, a critical that these elements are in the story, and they're like uh, footnotes in a history. Okay, let's talk about credibility. Let's focus on that for a minute, in GNI, grass new, gr grassroots news. Um, for everyone that's looking, um, I really wanna convey how important it is that you do some very simple things you get people's names that you're talking to, you spell their names correctly, and you ask them to spell their names. If, if Fred Smith, uh, have him spell his name for you because it could be spelled differently than you think it is. And um, get the town that you're reporting from, get the ages of the people that you're talking to, ask them if they've graduated from a, a college, um, ask them if they're married, ask them the names of their children, ask them where they went to school, ask them what business they do, and get all of these questions down. Every time you talk to someone, you should get all of these things. It's good practice for one thing, and also it helps you when somebody finally asks you, uh, who were these people, what do they do, what are their credibility that you have some answers on hand. And it also helps you, um, I'll talk to you a little bit later about what it helps you to do to control the interview. So get these things down. Find out who the people are that you're talking to. Um, in some of the cases of the stories we're talking to today, um, the Uganda story that we saw today, and you didn't see it on the video, but it was a story about adoption in Uganda. We saw the names of the people who were doing the adoption that were put up, it's called a key, underneath their names. And so it's important to get, um, especially in an international setting, it's important to get the names and the country of origin, where are they from? And there are three words that are important, that are gonna be important for grassroots. And this is sort of the dry stuff, but please take note of this, is protect, 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 are three important words. Protect the credibility, protect your legitimacy, and protect the objectivity. And earlier today I was talking about simple rule in journalism, when in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure the city you were in, leave it out. If you're not sure the name of the people that you were talking to, leave out their names. If you're not sure of what they said, leave out the quote. Don't take any chances and destroy your credibility and your legitimacy by putting in things that you're not sure of and later you'll be embarrassed when, when they find out it's not true. So what we wanna do is protect GNI right from the get-go and say, let's protect our legitimacy, our objectivity, and our um, uh, credibility. Let me talk a little bit about um, the way GNI goes about, well, my perception of the way GNI goes about um, being an advocate or not in a story. Now, there are some people who are into advocacy journalism, but I'm here to tell you that a journalist is not an advocate. <laughs> a journalist is a writer. A journalist is an observer. And what are you going to do if you decide to uh, do a story on a justice mission, for instance, and you get down there and you find out it's corrupt? Uh, the money is going off somewhere else. Um, it's, it's uh, um, you know, you're doing a three-part series and, you, and your first part is all, what a great mission this job, these people are doing. Look at these lives that are being changed. Two parts into the story you find out, oh my gosh, the leader's going to jail. <laughs> you know, he's under, he's under uh, uh, charges for corruption and, al and allegations of fraud. Well, um, it's good to ask these things before you, when you get onto a scene that you observe it, who's running this? And a good question for any journalist to ask is, where's the money going? Where's the money going? If there's money involved, where's it going and who's getting it? 
If you're covering a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which is the United States, but there are designations for other countries, uh, they're usually required to put tax forms online. In America, it's called the 990 forms, and you can access them online, and you can find out how much the leaders of nonprofit organizations are being paid. It's public information. And so you can ask a leader of a nonprofit, for instance, this is a very interesting work you've got here, uh, feeding orphans. How much are you getting paid every year to do it? And if they balk at it and won't tell you, it's a red flag that goes up right away. How come they won't tell me? It's public information anyway. Now, you don't want an adversarial relationship with the people you're interviewing, but you can say to them, um, you know, I can find this out publicly. You might as well just tell me. And some of the most uncomfortable information that the heads of nonprofits will want to tell you is how much they make. In the United States, it came out uh, about 15 years ago that the head of the International Red Cross, or American Red Cross, was making a six-figure salary, uh, close to a million dollars. And when that came to light, um, heads rolled, <laughs> pretty much. And this is not the kind of thing we look for as journalists, but something we should be aware of. So again, we're not advocates, we are journalists. Now, what does that do to someone who's a Christian as many of us are, you're working for grassroots and you go into an area that's a Christian organization. When well, you want to support it, right? You want to write a great story about it. You want, to, you, know, you want to put it in its best light. But that's not what a journalist does. A journalist observes the facts. What is happening here? How is it working? Um, are there any abuses? Um, what do I need to report on? What's the story here? So you're going into Uganda to an orphanage. And you start looking at, and you start asking questions. May I see the sleeping quarters? You know, how much is the staff paid? How much do you get? Um, do you own the property that the school is, is on? Who's paying for, when the property's paid off, who owns it? These are all uncomfortable questions. These are things you should keep in the back of your mind. This also helps protect us. I'm just saying these things, not so you can be contentious, but when you start doing reports, and some of these ministries worldwide, there have been ministries known to abuse and to, and to fleece the flock and to steal the money. Um, as we're doing reports on some of these things, keep these questions in the back of your mind so you don't embarrass yourself or Grassroots News or any other news outlet that you're submitting stories to or damage your reputation. Because once you submit a story that has a lot of erroneous facts or um, uh, props up a ministry, that is corrupt, the next time one of your stories comes through, they're gonna go, oh yeah, we remember. I wonder if this reporter got it down. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, I mean, it's important. It's dry stuff, but it's important to know. Now a journalist, I just wanna give you a brief description of what a journalist does at a newspaper. It's not a glamorous job. Uh, journalists are over, overworked and underpaid. They are usually the least paid people on the staff. Uh, the managers are paid more than the, than the cows, <laughs> than the cattle are. They're given stories every week to go out uh, and uh, to do. And they were given to them by assignments editor who looks at them and says, okay, you're the beat reporter for this county. We want a story on this crime, uh, this board of education, um, this runoff election that's happening, and the school bus problem that's happening. I want four stories, 500 words each, and I want it by Thursday. And you better have them in by Thursday. <laughs> and so that's what a journalist does. Now we, get a, we have a little bit of different scenario here in GNI. We get to pick our stories. We get to say, you know, this story interests me. I'm gonna spend a little more time on it. Shane and I were talking a little bit earlier today about how he wants to document things, spend more time on the stories, and that's great. But what's good about being a beat reporter and being forced to do the stories is that you are forced to do the stories. And the way a newspaper works, I'll just tell you and, and, and your competitors, and you should see them as your competitors, I think. Uh, CNN is your competitor. Um, ABC is your competitor. And you can bet your boots they will see you as, your, as, as their competitor once this thing gets big enough. You will not be looked at benignly. You'll be looked at as a competitor. Um, <clears throat> uh, they have a thing called the news hole. From 6 to 6.30, they have to fill up a certain amount of time with reports, or a newspaper has a certain amount of space that they have to put stories into. And if your story's due by Thursday, and you just had trouble writing it, the editor is not gonna take an excuse from you and say, well, I just didn't feel like it. You know, I just didn't get the inspiration for the school board meeting. I just didn't, 
you know, I just didn't have that hook that really grabs people. He's going to say, let me have it by 5.30 today. <laughs> Get it in. And what that does to you is it forces you to discipline yourself to write. And there's a, there's a plus to it, though. There is a, um, a freedom that comes out of it that makes you forget your ego. <laughs> You check your ego at the door and you just keep writing and you just and you see it in print and you go, geez, what a lousy story that was. But no one said anything about it, nobody complained, you didn't get fired, and next week you put out another story and it's not very good either. And the next week you say, Well, I could make this a little bit better if I do it this way, and you know, and you put out another story, and okay, well that's better, but it still wasn't very stellar, and pretty soon you're writing stories and it's coming to you, okay, here's what makes it work, here's what makes it good, here's what works, here's how it rolls off the tongue. And after about three years, you're just really cooking. You can write 15 inches. This rolls off your tongue. You know it works. Uh, you know the style of sentences that work. And um, it's great. It's really good. And then you start writing good stories and it becomes automatic. So don't despair, you beginning writers. First of all, get over a writer's block. The, um, the famous cartoonist Charles Schultz once said, uh, writer's block is for amateurs. He had to put out a comic strip every day. So keep writing. Don't be dismayed that your stories are boring. Just keep doing it, and they'll get good. I promise you, they'll be better. The other thing is that yeah, you can do it. Um, and I'm going to talk to you in our next session about what makes an interesting story. And the other thing is that if you keep at it, uh, you'll get good at it. It'll start, it'll start rolling out of you. OK, so. After three years, I thought I was a pretty good writer. Um, I, could, I could whip out 15 inches, about 500 words, um, like that. Um, I knew how to construct a sentence. And here's, by the way, here's hint number one. Please write this down. If you write print journalism, no, word, no sentences over 21 words. Do not write any sentences over 21 words. That's the Associated Press rule. Um, it works. Don't go over 21 words because no one will read it. And again, remember what a good story is, is a story that people read. Also, take the commas out of your story, even if it's great, uh, great English. To have commas in your story, take them out. The reason is because it's been proven that when the human eye hits a comma, people stop reading. And this is what you want them to do, is you want them to keep reading. So, no sentences over how many words? 21, 21 words. And by the way, you copywriters who are writing for documentary, you have to wonder how many, how many words the ear can hear before they stop listening. Avoid runoff sentences and avoid your commas. Okay, and what did Duke Ellington say about the rules? We started, huh? What was it? Forget, it? forget the rules. Learn everything on how to make a good song and forget it. It's the same with newspaper writing. If you look at newspapers, there's a lot of one sentence paragraphs in newspapers. Well, you're taught in English not to do that. Two sentences make a paragraph. Put commas in in all places. Take the commas out. Make it 21 words. And if you have to start your sentence with the word but, do it. <laughs> as long as they read it, it's a good story. And that's going to be your key. So, and we're going to get into that in the next session. So after three years, I thought I was a pretty good writer. But I want to encourage everyone who wants to learn how to write. Now, we're not trying to train professional journalists here for GNI. Now, we've talked about this with the staff. Um, all of you are interested in journalism, but whether or not you want to be professional journalists is, is debatable. Some of you may go on to be professional journalists, and you'll pursue the craft. Others of you want to be proficient in it, but not be professional about it, but put out a decent story. Well, it's going to take time and repetition. Any art takes time and repetition to do. And uh, after three years, I remember writing a column. I had a pretty popular column at the time. I was getting a lot of affirmation on my column. I was getting too much affirmation on my column. I wrote a funny column one time, and it, and it, it hit a nerve. Um, and so I started writing funny columns, humorous columns, with a spiritual point to it that was embedded in the story, with no God, no Christ, no Bible, but this spiritual principle was there. It turned out to be very popular. And I remember writing one of these columns out one time and thinking I would take it to the executive editor just to see what he thought of it. And the executive editor had been in the newspaper business for 35 years, and he'd seen everything. And he looked like, um, do you know that, uh, I hope he doesn't see this tape, but did you see the, you know the editor on Spider-Man? It was that guy, you know. 
Butler, what are you doing? Let me see that. Here, ah, it's junk. take it away. You know, that was him. So I went to Mr. Giametta and I said, oh, I said his name. Anyway, I went to, I went to him and I said, uh, would you read my column? He said, sure. And he brought it back and it was full of red marks. I mean, it was, looked like my ninth grade English class. It was full of red marks. Shorten the sentences here, tighten it up, use a different word. Um, this word is unintelligible. This sentence doesn't work. Move this here. It was just, and I took that thing after three years of writing and I'd been nominated for some awards for the Dallas Press Club. And I looked at this and I thought, boy, do I have a lot to learn. And I framed that column. I still have that, it's in my office. Every time I think, yeah, I, I'm, I know what I'm doing. I just look at that and think, there's more to learn. So the encouragement is there's more to learn. Don't despair, um, keep at it, learn all the rules of journalism that you can, then forget them. Now, what did I say about 21 words? Under, and didn't I make a rule there? But the, what did I just say about breaking the rules? So if you have a, if you have a 23 word sentence, but it, if people read it and grab it, uh, you know, it works. When I was in, um, when I started writing stories, I would write these huge long stories that probably, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, in the newspaper business, um, you were asked to keep your story short for a couple of reasons. There's a financial reason attached to it and there's a readership reason. So they would say, uh, when I first got there, it was a 25 inch story was maximum. Now there's 13 to 15 inches. I would write 52 inch stories. Can you imagine? And my editors were so nice to me, they would just look at it and go, Oh, okay. You know, they wouldn't say anything to me. They just let me do it until it they got beat out of me not to do that anymore. But then one day I went up to one of my assignment editors and I said, why did you let me write 52 inch stories two years ago? And he said, because people were reading them. He goes, and if the public reads them, that's fine. He said, you're one of the few writers who can write a 52 inch story and people will read it. He says, I wouldn't advise it very often. So what am I saying to you? You're all individuals. You have unique gifts. Let God point you in the directions. Believe in yourself and your intuition and what you do. Uh, grab a hold of your gift. It's going to be different from everybody else. Learn all the rules and then forget them. Okay? And let's start writing. And remember that writer's block is for amateurs. <laughs>